Geography Unit 6, Video 2 on Urban Geography. Let's take a look at our goals for this video. Our goals are to be able to describe factors that shape and change urban and suburban areas in the United States. Another goal is to use generally accepted models to explain the internal spatial structure of cities. So we are going to look at some terminology that you will need to be able to achieve these goals for the unit. First of all, we need to define urban settlements. Here we have a map showing the city limits of St. Paul, Minnesota. St. Paul is bordered by several other cities. It is an urban area and it's broken up into several little neighborhoods. Here we have the downtown area that many of you are familiar with with the XL Energy Center as well as the Science Museum being located in these areas. We define a city as an urban settlement that is legally independent and self-governing. In the United States, a city is surrounded, a city that is surrounded by suburbs is sometimes called a central city, like St. Paul, it would be a central city. A city has locally elected officials, the ability to raise taxes, and the responsibility for providing essential services. The boundaries of the cities define the geographic area within which the local government has legal authority. So St. Paul is known as what's called a central city. And around St. Paul, excluding Minneapolis, there are several suburbs or suburbanized area. Suburbs have sprouted up with the rapid growth of urban settlements. Many urban residents live in suburbs beyond the boundaries of the central city. So in places like Van Nuys Heights, South St. Paul, Richfield, Edina, Brooklyn Center, etc. In the United States, the central city and the surrounding built-up suburbs are called urbanized areas. Approximately 70% of Americans live in urbanized areas, including about 30% in central cities and 40% in the surrounding suburbs. Working with urbanized areas is difficult because few statistics are available about them. Most data in the United States and the other countries are collected for cities, counties, and other local government units, but urbanized areas as a whole do not necessarily correspond to government boundaries, such as this urbanized area is the Twin Cities, but we don't have specific research on the Twin Cities, rather we have research on the specific cities within that urbanized area. So suburbs often include, they're often smaller, they are independent, so they are separate cities, they're for mixed use purposes, and they are within commuting distance to the central city. This process has occurred over time and is called urbanization. So growth of cities and suburbs has occurred when the population shifts from a rural one to a more urban environment. This has occurred with the growth of cities over time. Here we see urbanization in action. Shanghai, China has approximately 22 million people living within the city currently. Here is the extent of the urban area in 1902. In 1816, there was just half a million people in that urban area. By 1914, the city had expanded north and west of its current boundaries. By 1944, you see it grow and condense toward the central city. By 1973, it significantly begins to spread. And currently, about 40 years after 1973, we see the current footprint of Shanghai, China, leading us to 22.9 million currently living in the city. With those with that growth, we have seen an increased demand as most residents do have access to water, electricity, and waste collection, but the population density does present significant environmental problems. For instance, air pollution from the city's dependence on coal plagues public health in a number of people. So we do see that urbanization in both suburbs and central cities does cause problems when it occurs very quickly. With the growth of cities, both in the United States and worldwide, and the problems that growing cities bring, we have seen a growth in what's called new urbanism. New urbanism is when urban design movement has promoted walkable neighborhoods to take the cars, buses, trains, etc., out of the neighborhood and make it more walkable again. New urbanism targets small, smart growth of cities and mixed use of cities. It is opposite of the 1950s suburban growth that you learned about in American history because it does not focus on the car. Rather, it focuses on pedestrian traffic. Here we can see a new urbanism in action. 
Seaside, Florida, which is a very small community in Florida, is a master planned urban community. It has a central location um, for residents and a very small, very well used urban area um, that is next to the ocean that was planned very specifically and strategically to promote pedestrian walkways rather than usage of cars. It was the setting for The Truman Show starring Jim Carrey that was filmed several years ago in that location. Here's a plan of the city of Seaside's code in 2012 regulating building use in their city. They have public square areas seen here and here, but then they also have residential units that border the ocean as well as city use or mixed use properties that all promote urban walkways for people while still being able to move cars throughout the city and the area. So this is new urbanism in action, planning for growth and designing growth to meet the needs of the people that live in that community. Every city must, must manage its transportation needs, whether it is a small city of just a few hundred people or a city of several thousand, such as the Twin Cities. Here we can see a map of one of the lines of the new light rail in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. This map shows the blue line, which runs all the way from Target Field down to Mall of America, that transports thousands of people back and forth between Mall of America, the airport, and downtown each day. Transportation creates systems, um, and those systems are things such as light rail, bus, subway, or freeways to move people in and around the urban area. However, there are several issues in urban areas. For example, we can look at this map, and this map records Minneapolis homicides in, from December 2003 to November 2013. So each area or each district within the city of Minneapolis is broken down into several parts. Here we have the university area, um, the central area, so this would be more of the downtown area, and then we have North Minneapolis, and you can see there's a heavier concentration of murders or homicides in those areas over a 10 year period than there are in the far south areas of Minneapolis um, where there is just one or zero such as the Nokomis area where Lake of the Isles was located. Within urban areas we have several issues such as poverty. Poverty is seen as cultural in urban areas as unwed mothers give birth to two-thirds of the babies in inner city U.S. neighborhoods and 80% of the children that live in inner city neighborhoods live with only one parent. Because of inadequate child care services, single mothers in these areas may be forced to choose between working to generate income and staying at home to take care of their children. Crime is also a problem. Inner city neighborhoods, such as those in central Minneapolis, have a relatively high share of metropolitan areas serious crime, such as murder, as evidenced here in North Minneapolis, which is heavily concentrated with a high population and high poverty rate. In addition, drugs are problematic in urban areas. Those that are trapped in a hopeless environment, um, like some inner city residents, turn to drugs. Although drug use is a problem in suburbs as well, rates have increased most rapidly in inner cities. Some drug users unfortunately obtain money through criminal activities, perpetuating the cycle of poverty, crime, and drugs. Homelessness is also an issue. Several million people are homeless in the United States. Most people are homeless because they cannot afford housing and have no regular income due to poverty, crime, and drugs in some cases. Homelessness may have been sparked by family problems or job loss and is typically um, cyclical for those people who suffer from homelessness. Lack of services is also an issue in urban areas. The concentration of low-income residents in inner-city neighborhoods of central cities has produced financial problems. These people require public services, but they can pay very little of the taxes to support such services. Central cities face a growing gap between the cost of needed services in inner city neighborhoods and the avail availability of funds to actually pay for those services. One of the most interesting problems that have plagued urban areas in the United States is this issue of blockbusting. Blockbusting is largely no longer in effect, but it was a business practice of the United, State, of United States real estate agents and building developers meant to encourage white property owners to sell their homes at a loss, thereby making a profit for the real estate agents and building developers, by implying that racial minorities were moving into their previously racially segregated neighborhood, thus depressing the real estate property values. 
This practice is illegal and it is unethical, but it is one of the problems that has plagued urban areas in the United States since the 1950s. Here is an example um, of, of an article from the Saturday Evening Post um, referencing Chicago in July of 1962. Obviously, it uses language of the times. Would you, would you panic if a Negro moved next door? And you can read the article from here on out. This is an example of blockbusting as real estate agents would discourage white families from moving into certain neighborhoods to keep neighborhoods segregated and therefore often segregated by income, by race, etc. So this is one of many problems in urban areas in the United States specifically. Those people who live in the inner city and face several challenges such as inadequate job skills, the culture of poverty, crime, drugs, homelessness, etc. have often turned to public housing to support their needs as public housing is always a preference to homelessness. Public housing is defined as government supported rent programs. Some people receive a very small amount of rent assistance. Other people have their rent entirely covered by government supported programs. Public housing is heavily concentrated in inner cities. As you can see the map here showing Minneapolis and St. Paul, the legend has the number of units um, of public housing units. Those are units that are subsidized or supported by government programs for those people who cannot afford their rent in those areas. So they're heavily concentrated in the inner city areas, but you do see several of them popping up in the outer suburbs as a way to try to promote equality of opportunity for people of these communities. Zoning is also an issue with public housing and other inner city challenges. Zoning is when local government laws dictate how real property can and cannot be used in certain and specific areas. Zoning laws limit commercial use of land in order to prevent oil, manufacturing, and other types of businesses from building in residential neighborhoods. For example, here in Byron, if you happen to live in Winsong, McDonald's would not be allowed to put up a building in Winsong because Winsong is zoned as single family residential home. Other areas in Byron are zoned specifically for businesses. For example, you could not move in to a house or rather build a house next to Ace Hardware in Byron because Byron has zoned that area for businesses only. So zoning does prevent the mixing of different communities, both residential and commercial together to try to keep the city's properties at a higher value for both parties. We can see an example of zoning here. Here is one of the photo options showing a possibility of a location for a new aquatic center here in Byron. This is 2nd Avenue Northeast. Um, this is Byron Avenue North. And then here are the train tracks. So this is Old Town Park, which many of you be, may be familiar with. Highway 14 is down here. So this is, area is zoned for public use. And since an aquatic center, here we have obviously a few different pools, parking lot, buildings, etc. It is zoned for public use and a pool would be considered public use. As urban areas grow, we have seen this process of what we call ex-urbanization. Ex-urbanization refers to the process in the 1990s when upper class city dwellers moved out of the cities in the United States beyond the suburbs to live in high end housing in the countryside. Ex-urbanization is a serious problem. As we can see in certain areas of the country, those indicated in different colors show the movement of people out of the major city areas and more into the countryside. As some cities begin to ex-urbanize or de-urbanize, we do see a process of what we call gentrification. Gentrification is the process by which middle class people move into deteriorated inner city neighborhoods and renovate the housing. Most cities have at least one gentrified inner city neighborhood. For example, in Minneapolis, Uptown is considered one of those areas. Here in Rochester, we see Kutsky Park, which is just north of the Mayo Clinic area and just east of the Miracle Mile Shopping Center near Hy-Vee Barlow's. We see it gaining gentrification status as middle class and upper class people are purchasing those homes, renovating those homes, and selling them at a higher profit. 
In a few cases, inner city never, neighborhoods never deteriorated because the community social elite maintained them as enclaves of expensive property, such as the Pill Hill or Southwest area.